Good evening, everybody. <coughs> this is <clears throat> day 30 in the 33 days to greater glory. And again, we had about 15 minutes of uh, discussion on the, the first word that Father Gately wanted us to focus on uh, from this week of the seven wonders. And um, the internet simply just would not work on it. And maybe I just need to <laughs> record it and send you this uh, even before I even try. Anyway, so we haven't had any luck with our live streaming. That's not working very well. So I'd like to do tonight is just very briefly take a look at these three words uh, that he gives uh, for us to meditate on today. And that is caring, life-giving, and tenderness. Caring, life-giving, and tenderness. And so we learn this, this caring that Jesus has. And, and what I mentioned earlier, and I'll put it in brief, you can listen to that 15-minute little uh, or 20-minute uh, little discussion there uh, if you can put up with the buffering. But um, that we all, we all care in a different way. We process and we reach out to other people because of different reasons, if you will, or not different reasons so much, but uh, different motivations. And about 75% of women, they can reach out and they care and they are interested in the person's well-being because of their gut, because of their heart. And this is the way women are built. Women are built to be able to make a relationship, immediate relationship between, let's say, a sick child who's no relation to the, themselves a sick child and maybe their own child or a child that they know and love dearly. An elderly person they might have care for or this, this care for, this tenderness for because they um, uh, have an elderly mother or an elderly grandmother or an elderly friend that they're, they're close to. And so when they look upon a child or a person is in need, a weakness of whatever sort, whatever, they have an ability to relate that to their own life experience. And that's beautiful. That's the feminine genius. Whereas men, and again, if we are properly trained, um, we have a care for that other person um, because it's our duty. Because it's just the right thing to do. And so a lot of times it is an operation through the mind, uh, through our, our process of thinking, if you will, that we reach out and say, this is what we do because we want to be a gentleman. We want to be a man who cares, right? And if we're trained as such, then we continue to reach out and do that. But we typically, we typically, it's not, how should I say, hardwired in us to be moved with the heart. That's about 75% of us men. We're not particularly hardwired to care for people. And so this is where the, the beauty of, of Jesus uh, and his experience with the Father and as he teaches us his commandments is that he challenges us men to truly care because it is the right thing to do because this is what the Father wants. This is the will of Jesus Christ that we come to the need or come to the assistance of those in need. We meet the needs of those who are less fortunate. And this is this, this duty of men. Again, because this is, uh, this again, we have to be kind of trained for this. We have to be taught this by our Father and especially by our Heavenly Father. So the men in our life need to teach us to do this. Secondly is the life-giving section. And this, I think, is so much part of men. Men are built to give life and protect life. We're called to make an impact on the world around us. We're called to protect that life, especially our children and our spouse. We are called to have that desire to set up a fortress, if you will, to protect that life. And so we are not only life-giving, but we're life-protecting. Women, on the other hand, are very much life-sustaining. They have this natural hardwire, if you will, hardware within them to sustain life. And they have a certain desire as well to bring that life to fruition, to 
well, let's go to the mother. Mother Mary, when she's at the, she did, she wanted to save the wedding couple embarrassment at the wedding feast of Cana. There was something that just reached out and said, you have to care for these people, give them that life, sustain that life. And so this mother's love, right? So she wants to sustain it. So us men, we have a particular duty uh, to give life. And that giving life always goes through sacrifice. We have a hard wire. We are hardwired to sacrifice ourselves if we want to be happy. So the greatest happiness that we men will experience is when somehow, some way, we are giving of ourselves. We are giving of ourselves. We're sacrificing of ourselves. It is there that we find, hey, that makes me happy. And so it's just, again, it's kind of how we're hardwired. So again, it's when we engage into that, that battle of life, if you will, so that we might be able to so that we might be able to sustain this life, to give this life to our children, to our spouse. We enjoy the battle. We enjoy the battle because the beauty that we are trying to win is the one, is, is the one we're willing to die for. And so all love generates life. So us men, we're called to engage it, engage the world to generate that life. Even though it may be sacrifice, we are life-giving. Last thing is tenderness. This does not come to us men easily. Uh, and again, it all depends upon our upbringing. This is the software that's written on our hardware, <laughs> right? So that it all depends on how is it that we might be uh, trained to be tender because we're usually not. One thing I love that little kids, little kids, <laughs> and I see parents, especially new parents, uh, when they have their first baby and the way that they, they, they treat the baby. And at the, at the very beginning, I always see that the dads are just totally unsure. Moms, for whatever reason, now, again, maybe, maybe I don't want to be too stereotypical. But moms can usually hold the baby, grab the baby, and they are not intimidated at all. They're not going to break the baby. Moms know that. We're not going to break the baby. Whereas dads are like treating it like a fragile porcelain doll. <laughs> it's like, ah, what do I do with this, right? I don't want to hurt it, you know, right? But the baby kind of learns this. The baby kind of learns that the body of dad, for instance, is not as soft as mommy. <laughs> so the body of dad is a different experience than mommy. And so this body of daddy is usually kind of hairy, scratchy, smelly. <laughs> and that's okay for the baby too, I guess, if that's kind of what he wants. But sometimes they want soft, especially when they get hurt or they get scared or something like that. They want to go to the comfort. They want to go to the soft body. And is there where the child experiences, this is far more tender over here than it is over in the daddy's arms. Because daddy eventually begins, especially, and again, this is cultural maybe or stereotypical, but a dad begins to handle the boy a little bit different than he handles his baby girl. That little baby boy, pretty soon he's on his arm or whatever, and pretty soon he's kind of over his shoulder a little bit and pretty soon he has them hanging upside down <laughs> and the baby likes that the boy likes that being upside down a little bit he'll do but he doesn't do that with the girl too much not at the beginning no 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 the dad might be throwing the baby up in the air and catching the baby uh, with his boy but with his girl he's a little bit hesitant to do that not till she gets older <laughs> tenderness Tenderness, Jesus teaches us tenderness because the Father has that tenderness. And so this, was, gentlemen, all these are lessons that we are called to learn. In a special way, I think this, this particular day is for us so that we might be able to learn the way, learn the way of caring, learn the way of life-giving, learn the way of tenderness. 
And so we're going to move through that uh, with Father Gately uh, tonight. But I thought I'd just kind of give my take on just a natural experience that we have. And through that experience, that's the software that's written on our hardware, on how is it that we might interact and reach out to, to others. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing is that, as I mentioned last day, we cannot give what we don't have. So we must begin to recognize the gifts that God has given us. And I think the first, the, when we talk about caring, we, the first thing we do is we recognize that the Heavenly Father cares for us. Because everything we have, everything we are, everything we can be is a pure gift from God. So God's caring for us. So if everything we have, are, and can be comes from our Heavenly Father, then how is it that we're supposed to interact with our spouse and interact with our children? Is that we need to care for them. That everything they have, everything that they can be is because of our care for them. So we have to reach out for them. Reach out to them and care for their needs. To be there emotionally supportive. To be there psychologically, you know, not non-neglect. We don't want to neglect. Because every single child is looking, for us men, every single child is looking for that identity. Especially boys looking for that masculinity. How is it that we interact with others? They're going to learn from us. We are their software in which they learn to, to care, how they learn to be tender, how they learn to retreat with respect, especially those who are weakest, those who are most in need, the young, the elderly, our spouses. So again, this care, I think we need to learn, especially from our Heavenly Father. Allow that gift as we recognize that how he cares for us, allow that gift to, to dwell within us, to swell within us, so that we can share those gifts uh, with others who are in need. Life-giving. Life-giving that it is that, is that I believe that we are born, we are hardwired as men. We're born to be life-giving and women are taught, uh, uh, and life protecting women are, are have a special way of life sustaining so again men again we are we're built like brutes right we're built like brutes so that we can take away life but when we can also protect life and so again we have to recognize that when we truly experience that life giving uh, that feeling that that it is usually when we give of ourselves. And when we give of ourselves, sacrifice ourselves out of love, that love generates life. And so we are life-giving. So this is, again, a, a challenge for us men. But this is, where, this is where, again, us men, we find happiness. We find happiness in sacrificing ourselves and giving ourselves. Uh, there's something about giving a good, hard day's work and at the end of the day, we've accomplished something. Dang it, that makes us happy, okay? So, again, part of who we are. Tenderness, I believe, has to be learned, especially for most of us men. How is it that we might be tender? Well, then we have to recognize we've been treated tenderly. We've been forgiven again and again and again by our Heavenly Father. And so we too have to forgive again and again and again. As we have been forgiven, so we are called to forgive again and again. And it's when we get caught up in our own ego, when we get caught up in our own, in our own pride, it holds us back from forgiving. So again, we must be able to say, hey, Lord, I'm going to give you my brokenness. I'm giving you my hurt. I want to give you my wounds that I've received. And I'm going to ask you to please touch them, heal them, put some salve on them so they can heal. Um, and then when we see another person maybe lashing out at us for whatever reason, 
we can say, wow, they're operating out of wounds. They're operating out of brokenness. They're operating out of deep set scars. And that's why they're afflicting us, afflicting their wrath, of, for instance, on us. We have to be able to say, hey, in tenderness, because I have been forgiven, I'm going to strive to forgive them. And that's where it is. I believe this takes grace. This is all grace uh, for us men. It takes training and grace. But first of all, I think we recognize gratitude. When we take a look at the life-giving power and this caring power, um, this is, this, we have to recognize the gifts we've been given and how we have been sustained. Tenderness is going to be uh, learned. Um, we have to take off the rough edges sometimes so that we might be able to be more receptive and careful uh, to that fragile heart that might be placed above us. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm thinking all these crazy Antifa crazy people, right? That's all coming from bro broken wounds. I mean, it's all coming from crazy, crazy. You know, I, I can almost guarantee you 100%, 100% of these crazy, violent kids have deep wounds, 100%, who have never, and they're being exploited, they're being used by other puppet masters. They're all being used, because, and then they're, those puppet masters are using the brokenness. They're using the wounds and the, and, the, and, the, and the tearing of their fabric of their heart. They're using these wounds for their own agenda. And this is why these kids are lashing out. This is why these kids are so violent and destructive and so foul in their language um, and so wicked, if you will, is because there's wounds so deep. They have been wounded so deeply that that's the only way they know how to express themselves is through the wound through the scar, through the fracturing of their own heart. So, and again, I, I think it takes a bit of a gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom to be able to see past the violence, past the outrage, see past all of that and look at the wounded heart. This is the great tragedy and this is where the great need for healing needs to be taken place. And so I think with the gift of wisdom comes the gift of counsel. So we might be able to uh, respond accordingly uh, to that hurt. Because if I go to the, the deep, dark recesses of my heart, when I see such violence or the destruction that's left in the wake of some of these kids, um, the burning down of the Wendy's or the shopping malls or the stores or total destruction of all these uh, fancy vehicles and stuff like that we saw in California. Um, all of that, I think, is, it's all out of woundedness and the deep recesses in my heart says whatever, they need to be punished and punished now. You know, uh, you know, it would not, should I say, hurt my feelings if they were just all taken out. If they're all deleted, you know, I mean, that's, that's from the very deep bones of a heart to see someone so dis uh, disrespect a person, uh, like this one lady, um, so sad. She was, these, these boys were kind of tormenting her, I think, whatever, on this video, and she was going to call 911. And as she was calling, this guy took the skateboard and just knocked her out. Such violence brings up the ire in me. And I want this, this, this person to be deleted. You know. Had a hundred and some arrests. This kid, funny, he didn't get caught. hundred and some arrests. And, and some of these uh, Democratic governors, uh, they let him out. Let him out because of COVID. I don't know how that, what, that, what that means, how that works. But they freed a lot of these prisoners. Uh, they emptied their jails. And it's like, did they not expect 
there to be an increase in violence, an increase in rage? Because these young, these young people were not rehabilitated. And so it's so sad. It's so sad that they're being used as pawns. And, and, their, and their outrage affects other innocent victims, other innocent people. And it just doesn't make sense. So again, my my heart is is, is you know moved you know because I feel the tension between the nature and the supernatural, uh, and it's not real pleasant. So let's go to page one fifty, caring, and I'm going to take the highlights here. Is the father caring? Of course he's caring. While women are better known for being more caring than men, God the Father is not a man. He's most certainly the Father. But he has also maternal characteristics, as we lead, learn, read in the sacred scripture, to help reveal this side of himself. The Father, heavenly God the Father gave us his mother at the wedding feast of Cana. I mentioned that. So that they would not be, the wedding couple would not be uh, embarrassed. We also saw how caring fa the Father is by the way he strove to con sold his son when the royal son uh, son's official was healed it was not just that the son I mean that the royal official's son was was healed at Jesus command but Jesus realized as Father Gately expressed that his heart was healed by his heavenly father so the heavenly father led him to heal that man's son and he realized my heart was healed as well in my time of distress. We further saw an example of this care when the, Jesus fed the multitude. He felt for them. He cared for them. How are we going to feed them? They, 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 some of them will not make it on the way back. So he feeds them. Cares for their well-being. He revealed that the Father can care for all our needs because He is Almighty. He is the one who the winds and the sea obeys. He has the power to do this. And if He has the power over the wind and the sea, He has the power to care for us and all our needs. Life-giving. Is the Father His life-giving? Of course. For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son also to have life in himself. He gives life. He generates life. Love generates life. And proceeding from the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. He generates life. And while none of us asked to be born, the Father wanted us to have life. He created us. He knit us in our mother's womb, as the prophet would say. And also while the paralytic by the pool may not have wanted to be healed, the Father wanted him and all of us to have a new life in him. And not just to be able to receive his sight, but to give the opportunity for the Jews, those who hated him, to see the work, to see the wonder, and give them another chance to accept his son, to accept the commands of his son. <laughs> that, again, is the Heavenly Father and his turn to mercy reaching out to those he knows are going to reject him to give him a chance, another chance, and another chance. He also gave us his son as the bread of life that whoever eats that might live forever. And as for death that came not from the father who has life in himself, but it came, that death came from sin. So the father wants to destroy sin, or destroy death. And he destroys death by destroying sin. So the father grieves just as Jesus wept at the, last, the death of Lazarus. He doesn't just grieve in the son, but he becomes perturbed. He becomes angry because of that wicked power of death, that wicked power of sin. And he wants to defeat it. He gives us an expression of the defeat. And all is a... The raising of Lazarus from the dead is a foreshadowing of what is going to occur to all humanity. Not just the humanity of Christ, but all humanity. He sent his son to die for us that we might be, so that he might overcome death and give us eternal life. So do we thank the Father? Do we thank the living Father for the gift of our lives and the gift of eternal life? 
Do we seek to be life-giving by making the Father known and by attending to the, those in our charge to attend to their needs? Tenderness. John Vanier, as we mentioned before, who worked with those who are handicapped, mentally and physically handicapped, John Vanier's whole mission was to care for those who were those most in need and so often rejected by society. And so Father Gately's Father Gately is using John Vanier's understanding of Lazarus. Why is it that Martha and Mary were not married? Is it because they cared for their handicapped Lazarus? They cared for the handicapped man. This is what draws Jesus to him is the loving care of Martha and Mary and Lazarus who was willing to receive that care. That is the home where Jesus and the Father wanted to rest, which tells us so much more about the heart of the Father. And that same tenderness of the Father through Jesus, he cured the man blind, apparently touched in a very important, apparently touch is very important to those who cannot see. And so Jesus healed the blind man Unlike the other miracles, he made spittle and, and, and dirt and clay and he wiped it on the man. He touched the man. He touched the lepers. He touched them. So for those who hunger and thirst in the desert of this life, the Father feeds us not only with our daily bread but with the body and blood of his own Son, which is a divine invention of the deepest intimacy and tenderness. For we also need to be touched. And the Father touches us through the Eucharist, Eucharistic body and blood of His Son. And as for judgment, the Father places before us life and death and He encourages us to choose life. So in today's meditation, in caring, do I take time each day at the end of the day to recognize the many ways the Father has cared for me and to thank Him for His gifts? life-giving when was the last time I thank God for the gift of my life gratitude and have I sought to show my gratitude by glorifying the Father with my life with my thoughts words actions what I've done what I failed to do right as we reflect on examine our conscience every night have we have we given glory to the Father by sharing our life and our thoughts, words, and actions. Tenderness. And do I bring my suffering before the Father with the expectation of receiving His tenderness and His encouragement? It is so profound, so profound that we might be able, we might be able to have that ability to share that tenderness, to share that encouragement by we ourselves remembering those times that we have been mercifully treated by the Father, that we have been encouraged by our Heavenly Father to get up, pick ourselves up, get back on the road, dust ourselves off, and keep going on this journey of faith. Today's prayer. Father is caring, life-giving, and tender. I would like to add, how are we Are we caring, tender, and life-giving as our Heavenly Father desires us to be? I think, again, it's a bit of just a little maturity in our own spiritual life when we count the hundreds and thousands of times the Lord has been so merciful to us that we are less quick to judge another. Uh, what is it, Francis de Sales? I forget. Whenever he heard someone talking about the scandalous actions or activities of another priest, he would look at the brothers and he says, I, but the grace of God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And for Pete's daughter, who's in ICU, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Prayer for a bountiful harvest and good favorable weather for our farmers. Remember, O most chaste spouse of the Virgin Mary, there never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left in aid. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, my spiritual father, and beg your protection, O foster father of the Redeemer. Despise not my petitions, but in your goodness hear and answer me. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. And continue to keep praying that we may figure out this crazy, crazy internet service I have here to see if it can be fixed. And uh, so it's so much more enjoyable for me to, and it gives me so much more life to be able to see the live chat and to respond back and forth a little bit more. And so anyway, so this concludes this recording. Thank you very much. I'll see you uh, with day 31. God bless you all.